Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المنتجبين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا قال الله في كتابه الحكيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إنما المؤمنون إخوة فأصلحوا بين أخويكم واتقوا الله لعلكم ترحمون صدق الله العلي العظيم وصلوا على محمد وآل محمد Chapter number 49 of the Holy Quran, Surat Al-Hujrat, is one of the more significant chapters that provides for us a template and a guideline as to what the ideal Islamic community should look like. It is also a chapter that describes the morals, the behaviors, the etiquette, what it means to be brothers of one another, what it means to be citizens of the same nation, what our rights are upon one another, what that looks like, what kind of relationships we should have with God and thus with one another. And this was a chapter that was revealed to the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ during the late Medinan period, meaning after the Muslims had taken over Mecca and after, had, after the religion of Islam had uh, expanded to the borders of the Arabian Peninsula. So with all of those complexities and all of that sophistication, there needed to be a template and a guideline as to what the ideal Islamic community should look like. And it begins with the most basic of behaviors. Ya ayyuha alladheena amanu la tarfa'u aswatakum fawqa sawtin nabi. O you who believe, do not raise your voice above the voice of the Prophet. It's named Al-Hujurat, referring to the Hujurat, which were the private rooms or the private apartments which were dedicated to the wives of, of the Prophet. And so the, the, the beginning theme of that verse is that you would have, uh, you would have a, a group of well-intentioned Muslims who were not very knowledgeable. They would... Wake the, they would attempt to wake up the Prophet before the time of Fajr so that he can emerge from the Hujurat, from the private apartments, to lead them in prayer. And so they would call upon him from behind the curtain, from behind the veil. And, and, and to respond to that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يُنَادُونَكَ مِنْ وَرَاءِ الحجرات, Those who call upon you from behind the curtain, from behind the veils, these are people that do not know. They are not informed. They would want the Prophet to emerge earlier because they were sleepy, they'd want to go back to sleep. Much like when you wake up for suhoor in the month of Ramadan and you're done with your suhoor and you're waiting for the fajr time so that you can pray and go back to sleep. So they had developed a sense of impatience and urgency. So basic behaviors needed to be taught. Basic behaviors needed to be learned. So that entire chapter encompasses all of the behaviors and the etiquette, uh, etiquette for developing a robust Islamic community. One which is based on the foundations and principles of respect and honor and dignity, love, compassion, and brotherhood. So a part of that 
One verse says, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ إِخْوَةٌ فَأَصْلِحُوا بَيْنَ أَخَوَيْكُمْ وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ لَعَلَّكُمْ تُرْحَمُونَ It addresses the idea of brotherhood and how we should treat each other when we're part of the same community. What does Islamic brotherhood look like? And what does Islamic citizenship look like? What should be the foundation of the ideal Islamic community? But before going on to that, I'd, I'd like to address an issue because some of you, as you go through school and um, as you go through your careers, you might be asked some of these questions. And one of these questions that has to do with citizenship and brotherhood is the issue of apostasy. What do I mean by that? Well, apostasy refers to the willful act of leaving one's community. And why it's an important topic and, and why it's important for you to understand is because some of you, whether young or old, whether you're in school or at your workplace or throughout your career, you'll be asked this question. Today, if you look at the news and if you look at provocative headlines, the issue of apostasy, meaning Muslims that choose to leave their faith, Muslims that choose to abandon their faith, is a hot topic. And so you may have been asked this question before, is that, why is that, that Muslims, why is it that they get so emotional? Or why is it that they lose their mind when someone chooses to leave the faith? I mean, what, what is so important about that? Why is it that in some Muslim countries, people have lost their lives, they've been, they've been killed simply because they've made the choice to renounce their faith? Well, to under, understand that answer, we have to understand the following, that today in the world that we live in, the world of the nation state, our primary form of identification, when you ask a person their primary form of identification, it usually has to do with the country that they're a part of. So you ask a person, where are you from? They say, I'm from Iraq, or I'm from Afghanistan, or I'm from Lebanon, or I'm from India, or I'm from the United States, I'm from Canada. That's the primary form of identification. Before the rise of the nation state, that was not the case. The primary form of identification, at least during the time of the Muslim community, was the Islamic community. Meaning that you pledged allegiance today in school, and this is also a, a controversial topic now, is that you pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, right? Most of you have, have learned this and, and you've memorized it. And even though that in, in recent times has become a controversial issue um, because of you know, pledging allegiance to, to the flag and people not wanting to stand up for the flag or the fact that it includes the name of God and some people who aren't so friendly with God, they don't like, they don't like that to be included in that clause in that pledge of allegiance. But most people, you pledge allegiance to a flag. If you're a citizen of a certain country, you pledge allegiance to that flag. Now, what happens if you decide that you don't want to be a citizen of that specific country anymore? Iran or Iraq or Lebanon or the United States or Canada. What happens? You as a citizen, you have the right to give up your citizenship and nobody's going to bother you. However, if you decide to give up your citizenship, but then fight against your country, that's a completely different story. When we look at the issue of apostasy, and when people ask you the question, well, why is it that Muslims in some countries, and not across the board, but in some countries, Muslims get so upset when somebody wants to leave the community, it's because there's a mis misunderstanding of what apostasy actually means. Apostasy does not refer to someone who wants to give up their faith. It refers to someone who wants to give up the faith, but then fight against the religion. And that's exactly what it is in the Quran. So when we talk about the laws of apostasy, when we talk about the punishment of apostasy, the punishment of apostasy only concerns those who wish to seek harm in the community, not the ones who want to relinquish or give up their citizenship to the community. I'll give you an example. Many people here in the United States, um, once they decide to you know, move overseas or for, for whatever reason, some of those people decide to give up their citizenship. Now as a citizen, 
it is uh, obligatory upon you to pay taxes, correct? Right? I mean, you, you have to pay taxes. So, some of you have probably heard this story, and um, this concerns the founders of, um, of Facebook. Um, if you've seen the movie, of course, you saw all the drama that took place. And uh, Facebook, which now has close to 2 billion users, I believe, started by a couple of guys in a dorm room at Harvard University. One of those men, um, not Mark Zuckerberg, another one, I forgot what his, what his name is, Eduardo Saverin. Eduardo Saverin, um, of course, that core group of people, they, they became, you know, it became a very lucrative business for them. They became multimillionaires and multi-billionaires. So, Eduardo Saverin, and he's the guy that he, he wrote the original algorithm for the original Facebook website. There was a falling out between him and, and that original group. So, in 2009, uh, he decided to move to Singapore. And he took up Singapore as his res residence. In 2011, he realized, okay, well, it's been a couple of years that I'm living in Singapore. I have no interest in the United States. I'm gonna continue to receive revenue. The money from that business is gonna continue to come in. Um, and so why should, I, why should I be a citizen of the United States if I don't need to? So he was hit with a tax bill of about $700 million. So what did he do? He renounced his citizenship. Nothing happened. He was allowed to live. He was allowed to still receive profit and revenue from his business. Of course, you know, when they asked him in the interview, he said, no, it has nothing to do with not paying taxes, but I mean, come on, $700 million. So he gave up his citizenship. Nothing happened. Why? Because he didn't show enmity. He didn't show hate to the United States. He didn't, you know, he didn't leave the United States and then join a, a, a terrorist organization to fight against the United States troops overseas. None of that happened. So his renunciation of his citizenship, it, it really didn't, it didn't harm him and it didn't harm anybody else. Maybe he got away from s some taxes, but that's okay. Taxes are inevitable. Somebody else is going to end up paying those taxes. The two things in life that are inevitable are death and taxes, right? So somebody else is going to end up paying those taxes. Now, there's another case. And that's the case of a gentleman, and we don't need to even mention these kinds of names from the member, but he was a gentleman who was born and raised here in the United States, and then he left, he went to a Middle Eastern country, and he joined a terrorist organization. And he began to produce videos, he began to encourage people to fight against the United States. What happened to him? Not only did he renounce his citizenship, not only did he give up his past of, 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 of citizenship, being part of the community, but he also sought to harm the community. So what did the United States do? They sent a drone with a missile, he was incinerated, he was gone, bye-bye, there was no more of him. So there's a difference between people who just give up their citizenship versus people who fight against the community. So when you look at the laws of apostasy in the Qur'an and when someone tries to provoke you and say, hey, well, why are you losing your mind if someone decides to give up their role or give up, give up part of being, them being a citizen of the Islamic community, well, the punishment laws have nothing to do with people who voluntarily give up. Across the Muslim world, there are many, many people, unfortunately, and that's their choice. We live in a world of choice. You're free to do whatever you want. That give up their faith. Nothing happens to them. So it's important to be able to, when you explain this, be able to move behind the provocative headlines. The reason why I bring this up is because we're talking about brotherhood. We're talking about citizenship. And sometimes you're going you're gonna to get this question. Somebody's going to ask, uh, ask you this question. And so it's important to be prepared and know how to respond to these questions. And it's mentioned in the Quran as well. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Holy Quran. He says, and this is in, in, the, in the beginning of chapter number 60, which is Surah Al-Mumtahana. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu. O you who believe. La tattakhidu aduwi wa aduwakum awliya. Do not take my enemy, my opponents, and your opponent as awliya. What is the meaning of the word awliya? Some people say, now awliya is the plural of the word wali. And some people say, 
The word wali means friend. Some people say it means guide. Some people say it refers to your successor. Some people say it refers to someone who has authority. Here in this verse, and in many verses of the Quran, it refers to someone who isn't just your friend, but someone who is your leader, someone who has influence and authority above you. For instance, in the verse in the Quran, إِنَّمَا وَلِيُّكُمْ إِنَّمَا وَلِيُّكُمْ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولُهُ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا الَّذِينَ يُقِيمُونَ الصَّلَاةَ وَيُؤْتُونَ الزَّكَاةَ وَهُمْ رَاكِعُونَ Verily, إِنَّمَا Verily, your awliya, your leaders, those who have influence, those who we have given authority over you, are whom? Number one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is your protector. That is your guide. When you have no other protector, when you have no other friend, when you have no other guide, when you feel loneliness, when you feel abandonment, number one is that. وَرَسُولُهُ his prophet, his messenger, and that is Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa So number one is God, number two is the prophet, and number three, وَالَّذِينَ amanu, Those who believe. But who specifically? Because if you're talking about those who believe, well, there are hundreds of people. There are thousands of people. But specifically, الَّذِينَ amanu, The ones who يُقِيمُونَ الصَّلَاةِ The ones who establish their prayers. وَيُؤْتُونَ zakat, And they give zakat, they give charity. وَهُمْ رَاكِعُونَ Not وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ رَاكِعُونَ وَهُمْ رَاكِعُونَ Meaning that when they give that zakah, when they give that charity, it is in the state of ruku'ah. And there was one man who gave charity in the state of ruku'ah. And that was Al-Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It is said that one day a man comes to the masjid and, and tonight we honor the character of Amir al-Mu'mineen. That generous Imam, that generous leader, the leader who gave everything that he had. And the Imam was offering his prayers and a beggar came and he, uh, he began to ask of the Muslims and nobody was willing to extend the hand and give except for that one generous man. In his prayer, he extended his hand and on his finger was a khatam, a ring, a valuable ring. And so the beggar took it as a sign, and this was, a, of course, a, a traveler, someone who had little subsistence, nothing to support himself. So he took it as a sign that this is a donation, it's a charity. So as the imam was in prostration, the beggar came and he removed the ring from his finger, and he went and sold it. And with that, he was able to sustain himself. He was able to food him, uh, feed himself and, 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 and get shelter and transportation to go back to where he came from. And so the verse was revealed that these are your awliya. Don't get it confused. These are your leaders. Allah, his prophet, and the one, the believer that gives charity while he is in the state of ruku'ah. He didn't need to be mentioned by name. You know, in the Arabic language, we say, Al kinayatu ablahu min tasrih, meaning that when someone is mentioned by their attributes, it's, it's more. It's more to the point and it's more eloquent than a person who is mentioned by name. Some people ask the question, well, if the Imams are so important, why aren't they mentioned by they, name? Maybe they're not mentioned by name, but they're mentioned by exclusive attributes, which, is, which carries even more weight. It's even more powerful. So, wali, going back to that word, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in this chapter, Ya ayyuhalladina amanu, O you who believe, la tattakhidu aduwi wa aduwakum awliya. Do not take my enemy. And your enemy has awliya, meaning people of authority. In another verse in the Quran, it says, لا تَتَّخُذُ الْيَهُودَ وَالنَّصَارَىٰ awliya." Do not take the people of the book as awliya. And that doesn't mean do not befriend the people of the book. Some people say that, well, the Quran says don't befriend anyone from the people of the book. My friend circle should only include Muslims. No, that's not true. You're mixing with the people of the book on a daily basis, Jews and Christians and people of other faiths. There's nothing wrong with befriending. But the Quran is saying, make sure that your friendship is not in a way where they have influence to where they can negatively influence your principles and your values. 
Be strong, be firm in your principles and values. The reason why this was revealed, this verse was revealed, it is narrated that before the Muslims decided to go back to Mecca in order to conquer Mecca, to bring it once again under the banner of Islam, once, uh, once the news was there that the Muslims in Medina had to mobilize and prepare the army, prepare their forces, one of the companions, a well-intentioned companion, Hatib ibn Abi Balta, he sent a servant girl by the name of Sarah. He gave her a letter and he said, take this to my allies in Mecca from the people of Quraysh and inform them that the Prophet and the army of the Muslims from Medina are planning to march onto the city of Mecca. So he sends it and this, uh, you know, if you look at if you look at modern day warfare, if you give, if you're in a military, if you're part of a, a, a military group and you send your plans to an enemy army, what's that called in, in modern day verbiage, in modern day terms, what's that called? Treachery or treason. And the law in every country across the board for treason is what? It's punishable how? By death. Punishable by death. So this person informed the Meccans of the intent of the Medinan army to march upon Mecca. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals to the Prophet through inspiration, through guidance, that this is what has happened. So the Prophet sends a number of the believers to intercept this message. When they intercept the message, they bring the young girl to the Prophet. The Prophet takes the letter and he reads the letter. So they summon the man who had written the letter, Hatib ibn Abi Balta. So uh, the Prophet reads the letter and he summons him. He says, what's, what's going on here? So immediately, one of the more hot-headed companions, he says, Ya Rasulullah, off with his head. Let's decapitate him. The Prophet said, no. Wait a minute. Just wait. Hold your horses. Let him explain himself. So he explained himself. He says, Ya Rasulullah, my intent was not to do any harm. I had no intent to do any harm. He says, the only reason I sent this letter is because I feared for my life. I was afraid that we would arrive in Mecca and I would have no one there to shelter me. Everybody else has people to shelter them. I have no family, nobody to shelter me. So my intent was not to harm the community. And I have not disbelieved after, disbelieved after accepting belief. I want you to know this, Ya Rasulullah, that my heart is still full of Iman. I was only fearful. Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala says, Ya Ayyuhalladheena Amin, O you who believe, don't worry. Don't take your enemy and my enemy as awliya. You do not need their protection. You have my protection. You have the protection of Rasulullah. You have the protection of the Islamic community. Don't go looking for protection in areas with people that do not have your best interests in mind. So that allows us to understand that, that even in those very extreme cases, Rasulullah did not punish that person. He did not send that person to exile. There are some people within the Muslim, and, and to take that example even further, there are some people within the Muslim community that decided after a while that they didn't want to be Muslims anymore. One example was a gentleman who was the husband of Um Habiba. Um Habiba became one of the wives of the Prophet. This gentleman was among the first core group of Muslims who migrated from Mecca to Abyssinia. You know there are two migrations, there are two hijras. One hijrah was from Mecca to Medina. That's the hijrah that we all know. That's the hijrah um, that marked the beginning of the Islamic calendar. So when we say in the year 8 Hijri or in the year 10 Hijri, that means 8 years or 10 years after the hijrah, the migration from Mecca to Medina. But the migration that took place before was the migration from Mecca to Habasha, to Abyssinia. And that was led by Ja'far ibn Abi Talib, the brother of Amir al-Mu'mineen, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib sallallahu wa sallam One of the people that migrated, who, who were among the early Muslims, 
He decided that after a while, because they spent a few years there, he decided that when the Muslims went back to the Arabian Peninsula, when they went to Medina, he decided, you know what? I think I like Christianity a little bit more. So he accepted Christianity. What happened? Did the Prophet send assassins to kill him, to murder him? Nothing happened. His wife, Um Habiba, on the other hand, she wanted to remain as a Muslim. So she did not want to remain in that situation, that relationship. So she left that relationship. And the Prophet married this woman. Nothing, nothing happened. He decided to give up. So what is important is understanding. So, so now we move on to that question. Well, well what, is it that, what is it that bonds the Muslim community together? What is it that brings us together? And the answer to that is that what bonds the Muslim together are principles and values. See, when the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, when he migrated from Mecca to Medina, he realized that, that Medina, in terms of demographics, in terms of faith, in terms of uh, uh, religion, practice and rituals, it was different than Mecca. Medina was more of a mosaic. Yes, you had the people of the book, you had certain Jewish tribes that lived there, you had uh, the three main Jewish tribes which were the Banu Nadir, Banu Qurayza, Banu Qaynuqa. You had idolaters that lived there, you had people who had remained on the belief, on monotheistic belief, and among them were those who invited the Prophet to move, to make the move, the migration from Mecca to Medina. So it was a mosaic. You had people from different tribes. You had the Aus and the Khazraj who were fighting a battle for more than 100 years. It was a, a bloodlust that they had developed between them. And, and no one really knew why they were fighting the battle in the first place. So the Prophet had to unite everybody under one banner. So as soon as the Prophet arrived, he established, he established what was known as Sahifatul Medina, the constitution of Medina. And like any country that you migrate to, if, if you migrate to, to the United States and you want to become a citizen of the United States, you have to take a citizenship test. And so that citizenship test, um, you know, they, they make sure that you haven't, you're not a felon, that you've paid your taxes. Some cases, they want to know that you have a clean driving record. Someone was telling me that during his citizenship test, the first thing that the interviewer asked him was, you know, hand over your driver's license and um, do you have any speeding tickets? That was the first question. So you have to prove your loyalty. You have to prove that you belong. And how do you prove that? Well, sometimes you, have, you also have to take a citizenship test in which you can demonstrate your know-how, that you know what kind of principles this country was built on, what kind of values this country was built on. You have to be willing to defend the principles and the values. If, you, if you're born in this country, and if you haven't gotten this letter in the mail, you will get it in the mail once you're 18 years old. It's a letter that you have to sign. That if there is to be a draft, if there is to be a draft, a military draft, um, that you'd be drafted in the military. Meaning that you'd be willing to lay down your life for the principles and the values of this country. So the Prophet, that's how he united people. He said, listen, even though we are of different backgrounds, even though we are of different faiths, the Jews can remain on Judaism, the Christians can remain on Christianity. And even those who are idolaters, if they want to do that in private, they can do that in private. But we must unite on the values of brotherhood, on the values of citizenship, on the values of respect. Meaning that no one person shall ally themselves with the enemy, shall fight against another citizen of this new Islamic community. Now, some of the people in that community decided that they would not, they would not uphold and they would not honor the clauses of that constitution. And that's why you had the Battle of Banu Nadir and the Battle of Banu Quraiza and the Battle of Banu Qaynuqa because these were groups that decided that they weren't going to honor the shared values and principles. So the Prophet said in order to bring each other, we must believe in the same thing. 
We must have respect and honor for one another. We must have love for one another. We must have compassion for one another. We must have empathy for one another. And the one thing, brothers and sisters, that united the true believers, that core group of believers was what? The love of the Prophet and his household. The love of the Prophet and his Ahlul Bayt alayhi Sallu ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. And tonight is a very significant night. It's a very special night. It's a night in which through our obedience and through our loyalty, we, we express our love for the Ahlul Bayt It is a, a, a night in which we honor the flag bearer of the Ahlul Bayt and that is Al-Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. A man who showed his love for the Prophet. A man who showed his allegiance to the Prophet. A man who showed his undying loyalty to the Prophet. A man who through that love and allegiance and loyalty transcended the highest ranks of companionship. No other person, no other companion, no other believer even came second or third or fourth in line to Amir al-Mu'mineen. And it was because he loved the Prophet so much and he showed allegiance to the Prophet and he showed his loyalty to the Prophet that that was also reciprocated to them, to him. You know, when you love truly out of the depth of your heart, when you have loyalty and that stems out of the depth of your heart, one day down the road, you will find people who will reciprocate that love to you. They will also fall in love with you. They will also show their allegiance to you. They will also show their companionship and their loyalty to you. And I just want to take a few minutes and talk about some of those core companions of Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam. Because you get to understand a person through his protégés, through the people that he builds, through the followers that he builds. And that love, that, that, that very powerful ingredient, that, that, that very powerful element that bonded the believers. You know, it is narrated that, and this is narrated from a number of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt Ali Musalam in a number of different versions, the following hadith. It says the following. It says, Shi'atuna minna, our followers, our Shia, they are from us. They belong to us. And the way that you know that they belong to us is that they have been created out of the leftover of the clay or the dirt that we were created from. So when God created the members of the Ahlul Bayt when He fashioned them, whatever was left over, if you've ever built something and you've had leftover material, whatever was left over, our followers, our Shia, they were fashioned from that. So we are directly, brothers and sisters, we are, we're directly connected to the Ahlul Bayt Ali Musalam. So our love and our allegiance and our loyalty, it is something which comes, it, 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 it comes naturally from within us. You know, there's, there's a, a few beautiful lines of poetry in which the poet expresses his love for Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam. He says, وَلَايَتِي لِأَمِيرَ النَّحْلِ تَكْفِينِي عِنْدَ الْمَمَاتِ وَتَغْسِيلِي وَتَكْفِينِي وَطِينَتِي عُجِنَتْ مِنْ قَبْلِ تَكْفِينِي وَلَايَتِي لِأَمِيرَ النَّحْلِ تَكْفِينِي عِنْدَ الْمَمَاتِ وَتَغْسِيلِي وَتَكْفِينِي وَطِينَتِي عُجِنَتْ مِنْ قَبْلِ تَكْوِينِي بِحُبِّ حَيْدَرٍ كَيْفَ النَّارِ تَكْوِينِي He says that my, my love and my loyalty to, to Haydar, to Ali ibn Abi Talib. It is something that was fashioned within me before I was even born. It was something that was molded with my clay before I was even created. And for that love, how then can the fire of Nar Jahannam punish me? When I have so much love and loyalty in my heart for the Ahlul Bayt When I have so much love and loyalty to Ali ibn Abi Talib. You know, it's, it's narrated 
one of the most loyal companions of Amir al-Mu'mineen, of the Ahl al-Bayt, but specifically of Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam, was Abu Dhar al-Ghifari. Abu Dhar al-Ghifari was a great companion. And he was among the first Muslims, he was among the, the first believers to accept Islam. Probably among the first five or the first ten. A man who had no prior relationship to the Prophet, a man who had no prior relationship to the Ahlul Bayt, but deep within him, he had a love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So one day he comes, to Medi uh, he comes to Mecca. Before the Prophet even began to propagate his mission, he finds the Prophet, he accepts the message of Islam. It was what he was looking for his entire life. He lives a life of servitude and loyalty to the Prophet. After that, he lives a life of servitude and loyalty to Amir al Mu'mineen. And Abu Dhar was a very outspoken critic of the government that fought against Amir al-Mu'mineen and that was the government. First, first he was an outspoken critic of Uthman ibn Affan and then he became a, an outspoken critic of Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan. And it is said that he was so outspoken that they tried to, you know, they tried to give him hush money in order to keep him quiet. But when you have a love and a passion and a desire in your heart, no amount of money, no political position, nothing can keep you quiet. So it said that Uthman sent a couple of people to the home of Abu Dhar. And Abu Dhar was a man of very, very little means. So much so that when he died, he died alone. There was no one even to bury him. He was exiled to Rabada, where, where he originated from. It was a, a, a desert town where no one was. And there were not even, there, he died of hunger, he died of starvation. But he died with a heart full of love and loyalty for the Ahlul Bayt So Uthman comes to him, uh, he, he sends two people to him with 200 dirhams, 200 silver dirhams, which is a lot of money. It's enough for someone to, you know, really take care of themselves and have a surplus, extra amount. So they came to his home, they knocked the door, he opened the door and they saw him, you know, they looked around and they said, here's a gift that the Khalifa has sent to you, 200 dirhams. So he looks to them and he says that, have I been singled out? Is there something special about me? Or has every other Muslim, see, Abu Dhar was a true citizen of the community in that he's, he was worried about, he was concerned and worried about the welfare of every other citizen in the community. He said, did every other community member receive this gift as well? Or have you just favored me? This was a man who was so outspoken that he had to be exiled from Medina. He was taken from Medina to Damascus. Muawiyah couldn't handle him in Damascus, so he exiled him. He actually had him live not, not even in Damascus because he didn't want him influencing the people. Again, this was the companion of the Prophet. So he sent him to the coast of, um, at that time, what was the outskirts of Damascus, which is present day Lebanon. And that's where he planted the seeds of Shi'ism. So the scholars that originate from southern Lebanon, all of them go back to the tradition of Abu Dhar al Ghifari. Many of the Shi'i scholars today, Al Hur al Amili, Mecca um, uh, uh, al-Amili, Zainuddin al-Amili, all of these scholars that came from that Jabal al-Amil was thanks to the efforts of Abu Dhar. But even there, he did not stop his condemnation and his criticizing. So they took him back to Medina. When he went back to Medina, they realized they couldn't hush him up, so they tried to give him a bribe. So they gave him the 200. He looked at it. He said, did everybody else have this? And he said, no, this is, this is a special gift. So he looks around. And he says, you may not see it now, but I am wealthy beyond measure. So they look around, they're confused. There's no exotic car, and excuse me, no exotic camel parked outside. It's a very simple home. He's not wearing the latest designer fashion. There's no fancy furniture around, but he's saying I'm wealthy beyond measure. They say, well, well, just use this to, to, just for some subsistence to get you, yourself on your feet. So he points to them. He says, you see that mat over there? He says, lift it up. They lift it up. They see one piece of barley bread. He says, that's all I need 
For subsistence, that's all I need. And then he says something very, very powerful. He says, you're trying to give me wealth, ghana. He says, Asbahtu ghaniyan bi wilayati Ali ibn Abi Talib. You understand what that means? He says, I have become ghani. I have become wealthy beyond measure because I have the wilaya, the love of Ali ibn Abi Talib in my heart. And because I have that, I need nothing else. Everything else I can forego. Everything else I can give up. Brothers and sisters, tonight is a night of reflection. Remember, remember your master. Remember his companions. It's okay to enjoy the luxuries of life. There's nothing wrong with that at all. There's nothing haram about that. But remember, if you don't furnish your love, if you don't furnish your heart with the love of Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, then none of that is valuable. None of that is actual zina. That was Abu Dhar al-Ghifari. Another companion, a level above, Salman al-Muhammadi. There's a narration that says that if Abu Dhar, now imagine how great Abu Dhar was. It says, imagine, it's, the hadith says the following. That if Abu Dhar knew what was in the heart of Salman, that he would have fought him over it. Meaning that Salman was on a completely different level of love and allegiance and piety and belief. Salman stands in front of the Muslims. After the martyrdom of the Prophet and after they have abandoned. And look at his level of belief. He says, oh people, for those of you that know me, you know me. For those of you that do not know me, Salman, let me introduce myself. And here he stands in defense of Amir al muminin He says, he says, now that you have decided to turn away from this great man, Ali ibn Abi Talib, you will bear the consequences. He says, but let me remind you that had you followed this man in the way that the Prophet had told you to follow this man, and Salman does not exaggerate. He doesn't lie. He doesn't add herbs and spices to the stories. He says that had you followed this man, had you truly followed him in the way that had been willed for you, you would have called upon the birds in the sky and they would have responded to you. You would have called upon the creatures in the ocean and they would have responded to you. Anything that you would want in this world, food, drink, anything that you would want, it would happen at will. Only if you had followed this man. And this isn't an exaggeration. This is in fact reflective of a hadith Qudsi. It says, Abdi ata'ni takun mithli. My servant, my slave, worship me, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. Worship me, obey me, and you will be my, like me. In the same way that I say, kun fayakun. In the same way that I want something to be and it will be, you will want things to be and they will be. Dedicate yourself to me. Abdi khalaqtu al-alama li ajlik wa khalaqtuka li ajli. My servant, my slave, I've created this world and everything in it for you. I've made you on the top of the food chain. If you look at the human being and where we fall in the, in the food chain, we're on the top. Right? There's, no, there's no predator out there. There's no natural... I mean, we don't live in the age of dinosaurs anymore. So there's nothing to worry about when you step out of your house. The only thing to worry about is other human beings. But in terms of the food chain, you're at the top of the food chain. Everything has been made subservient to you. The animals, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, we have made them so that they can give you cloth. You can extract cloth from them so that you can ride on top of them. They can be your vehicles and that you, you can eat from them. I mean, we've, we've even reached things which are millions of miles away. We're able to access planets. We're, ac we're able to access the sun and the solar energy from the sun. Everything has been created from you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. خَلَقْتُ الْعَالَمَ لِأَجْلِكَ However, وَخَلَقْتُكَ لِأَجْلِكَ But I've created you for me. So if you dedicate yourself to me, everything in this world will belong to you. This is what Salman taught the believers after they abandoned the family of the Prophet. Someone who is at another level of love and belief. So what binds us together, brothers and sisters? What's that one ingredient? It's that source material that we were created from. That the Imam says that we were created from teen, from clay, and you were created from the leftover clay. So let us return to that source. Let us return to that source of love and mercy and compassion. 
If we honor the same principles, if we have the same belief system and the same value system, nothing can tear us apart. إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ إِخْوَى The Qur'an says, the brothers, the ones who are citizens of the same nation, are the believers, al-mu'minun. The ones who believe in the same mission. The ones who love one another and honor one another. فَأَصْلِحُوا بَيْنَ أَخَوَيْكُمْ وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ لَعَلَّكُمْ تُرْحَمُونَ أَصْلِحُوا بَيْنَ أَخَوَيْكُمْ Make mends. Fix the broken relationships. Some of us, we are here tonight and we have broken relationships with our fathers, with our mothers, with our brothers, with our nephews, with our cousins, with our friends, with our in-laws, with our fellow community members. We have broken relationships. فَأَصْلِحُوا بَيْنَ أَخَوَيْكُمْ The Qur'an says. Because you share in that love and belief, bring together the believers. Do islah, make amends. One narration says, الإصلاح ذات البين أفضل من عامة الصلاة والصيام. That if you're if you're able to bring two believers together, if you are able to fix a broken relationship, that is more rewarding than all of the prayers and all of the fasting that you can perform. In another narration, similar to this narration, أفضل من عبادة الثقلين. It is more valuable. Then the ibadah, then the worship of the thaqalain. Who are the thaqalain? Al insu al jinn, the human beings and the jinn. If you were to tally and total up all of their ibadah, bringing two, the act of bringing two people together is more valuable than all of that. So take this chance, brothers and sisters. It is a night of mercy, it is a night of forgiveness. And if we want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us, you know, I was listening to someone today, a scholar, and he was saying that. He was saying, take this chance, this night, as an opportunity to forgive. There are some people who right now, they are in their graves. They are being punished because you still are holding a grudge against them. Because you still have not forgiven them. Do you want to be in that situation one day? Where you are in the grave? And because somebody else has decided not to forgive you and to hold back, that you are being punished in the grave? If you want to be free of that, from the bottom of your heart, tonight take the, the opportunity to forgive that person. Say, Oh Allah, as a sign of thankfulness to you, Amir al muminin he says in his hadith, as a sign of thankfulness, when you have been given the ability to take revenge from someone or to hurt someone, as a sign of thankfulness, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, forgive that person, as a sign of thankfulness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it is in this night where we commemorate the passing away of our master, Amir al-Mu'mineen. And we know that during these final few nights, Amir al-Mu'mineen spent it in making amends, in showing his love and his compassion, in fixing the affairs of the Ummah, in admonishing his core group, which were his sons, Al Hassan and Al Hussein, and those very close companions, Salman, Abu Dhar, Al Miqdad, that core group of companions, some of them who had passed, some of them who were there. And Amir al Mu'mineen reminded them of the Quran, he reminded them of the prayer, he reminded them of the Aytam. This is a night, brothers and sisters, where we need to rededicate ourselves to reading and understanding the Qur'an, if you haven't done so. We need to dedicate ourselves to fixing our prayer. We need to dedicate ourselves to more charitable causes. We need to dedicate ourselves to fixing relationships between people. This is a bond, and, and, and if you do this, you will create bonds in your community. You will create bonds of brotherhood in your community that nothing can get in, in the way of. And Amir al muminin alayhi salam was that man who dedicated his entire life. And it was during these final moments that he understood that this was his destiny. This was what the Prophet had promised him. He knew that he was finally fulfilling his destiny. And it was there 
when he gave his final few breaths and he passed away from this world until the next world. And after he was buried, it is said that when Al Hassan and Hussein السلام, when they were returning after the burial, after they had buried their father, they were returning, they passed by some ruins. And when they passed by these ruins, they heard a man who was there who was murmuring, he was making noise, he was complaining. And so they sat with him, it was a man who had lost his eyesight. They turned to him, they said, Oh man, what is, what is going on? You seem to be in anguish, you're distraught, you're in pain. He said to him, it has been a few days where there was a master who would come to me and he would provide for me food, he would provide for me sustenance, and he would sit with me and he would speak to me when no one else would speak to me. He would provide me comfort. He would give me love and compassion and it has been a few days where this man was, has, has been absent. So immediately Imam Hassan and Imam Hussein, they knew who this man was. They knew that it was their father, Amir al-Mu'mineen. So they began to weep. They said, what is the description of this man? He says, I'm a blind man. I, I could not tell what he looked like. And so they said, begin to describe what, what would he say to you and how would he speak to you? So he began to say that this is how he would speak and this is what he would say immediately. When he began to describe, it was confirmed to them that this was their father, Amir al-Mu'mineen. He said, oh man, do you know who this man was? He says, no, I have no idea. He says, this was our father, the commander of the believer, Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib. And he had just passed away. When he heard, he said, this was Amir al-Mu'mineen. Amir al-Mu'mineen, every night he would leave and he would come to me and he would feed me and he would sit down with me. This was the commander of the faithful. And so he would weep. He said, please, now take me to his grave. They took him to the grave of Amir al-Mu'mineen. He sat there and he wept and he wept and he wept until he passed away. And when he passed away, he was buried next to his commander, Hani al May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant all of us such an honor, such a reward. This was a man who had nothing, but his heart was full of the love of Amir al-Mu'mineen. And so we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on this blessed night to fill our hearts with the love of Amir al-Mu'mineen. Oh Allah, do not allow us to depart this dunya without, without allowing us to fill our hearts with the compassion and the love and the mercy that we learn from the Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam. Brothers and sisters, on this holy night, let us turn our hearts towards the commander of the faithful. Let us to turn our hearts towards all of those across the world that are oppressed, the ones who Amir al-Mu'mineen stood for. Let us dedicate ourselves and our lives to the service of those who are oppressed. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allahumma ghafir al-Mu'mineen wal-Mu'minati wal-Muslimin wal-Muslimat al-Ahyai minhum wal-Amwat tabi' baynana wa baynahum bil-Khayrat innaka mujibu al-Da'awat إنك قاضي الحاجات إنك على كل شيء قدير برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين وصلى الله وسلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين